Okay, hello everyone. Good morning, good afternoon. Welcome to this webinar on behavioral interventions for the use of evaluation findings. This webinar is building off an activity uh, from the Data for Impact or D4I project funded by USAID. And my name is Agata Swota. I am the activity lead on this activity. And I am going to be co-presenting today with my colleagues, Cassandra Ake. She is, and Lucinda Jones. Great, next please. So today the agenda is as follows. I will first give you a brief overview of the activity. So I'll share the study research questions and the methodology, and then we'll go right into the barriers and enablers to the use of evaluation findings at USAID. Then we'll share some of the promising strategies that we've identified that address the barriers uh, and that uh, build on the enablers. And then we'll have time for a Q&A. And for, if you have any questions uh, that come up during the presentation, please pop them into the Q&A uh, box and not into the chat. So next slide, please. Great. So what was the study? We had two research questions. First, what are behavioral barriers and enablers to the use of evaluation findings in USAID global health programs by key stakeholders? And second, what are promising strategies for increasing the use of evaluation findings in USAID global health programs by key stakeholders that address behavioral barriers and build on behavioral enablers? Next, please. And here's what our methodology was. We started off with a literature review of barriers and enablers to the use of evidence more generally. And then we focused in on evaluations in USAID global health programs. And for that, we carried out interviews. Um, the first group was with individuals related to four different evaluations. And for each evaluation, we spoke with the funders at USAID who made a decision regarding the evaluation, with the evaluators themselves, and then also with the intended users of the evaluations. And that included staff at USAID, but also uh, at Im implementing partners. And then we also spoke to individuals who have experience with uh, working to increase the use of evaluation findings. After that, we carried out a thematic analysis of the transcripts from the interviews to identify these kind of key uh, barriers and enablers. And from that, we designed a number of promising strategies. And to do that, we carried out a further targeted literature review where we really looked at the behavioral science literature. So uh, literature in all fields of behavioral economics, sociology and psychology and, and so on. Next, please. So we'll move right into the barriers and enablers to the use of evaluation findings at USAID. And I'll hand over to Cassandra for that part. Hi, everybody. Um, and so as uh, Agata mentioned, we did conduct a literature review into the barriers and, and enablers in general um, to the use of evaluation findings. And then we conducted interviews to see it, to what extent those same barriers and enablers uh, resonated with the staff at USAID. Next slide, please. So the first enabler we found to the use of evidence was intrinsic motivation. Intrinsic motivation to use evaluation findings was evident in a number of the interviews we conducted with USAID staff. And this is the in inherent satisfaction of engaging in a behavior and it exists regardless of external rewards or punishments. At USAID, relevant intrinsic motivations included a desire to build on the body of evidence, to make sure that research conducted with taxpayer dollars was useful, and to improve projects or programs and thereby increase their positive impacts. Motivation to use findings appears to increase if the person has the skills to use the evidence and if the use of findings impacts positively on their job performance. However, motivation at USAID could still be strengthened and the decision-making context could be changed to further support evaluation use. Next slide, please. 
From the interviews conducted, it seems that cognitive biases may be impacting the use of evaluation findings. Uh, the two that were most relevant um, to our interviews were confirmation bias and status quo bias. Confirmation bias um, and the USAID context is that some USAID staff followed evaluation uh, activities closely throughout their lifetime and expressed that because of that, things that were expressed in the evaluation were nothing new to them. While surprising or differing findings sometimes did catch their attention, some staff expressed a reluctance to consider such findings when they contradicted their previously formed opinions. Evidence shows us that this cognitive bias is even more pronounced when evidence contradicts a person's deeply held beliefs or values. The next is status quo bias, which refers to a reluctance to change because the expected risks or the cost of a change outweigh the expected benefits. In the USAID context, interviewees stated that it was difficult when the findings came late in the program cycle to want to overcome the administrative hurdles necessary for a mid-term activity adjustment. These cognitive biases may lead to cherry-picking evidence to inform decision-making, either consciously or subconsciously. Next slide, please. While many interventions to increase evidence use focus on increasing capacity to understand and apply evidence, for example, the ability to read statistical tables, Capacity to make sense of evaluation findings is not a serious barrier at USAID. Interviewees generally felt that both themselves and their colleagues understood evaluation findings quite well. Some respondents commented that it would be useful for project teams to see the role of evaluations as learning tools and not solely as accountability tools. This would hopefully increase people's receptiveness to constructive critique but would involve building uh, trust with evaluators. Interviewees hoped that if these, we did try to build trust with evaluators, this would help decrease defensiveness when evaluators presented negative findings as well as increase evaluation use. Next slide, please. The research shows us that dissemination formats are the way the, the information is synthesized, packaged, and communicated to decision makers can negatively impact on capacity and motivation to use findings. There are few tailored dissemination products for different groups, including those that pull out the most relevant information for audiences. The final report and the final presentation is generally targeted toward USAID without much consideration of the content and formats that would be most useful to other stakeholders, such as local governments, implementing partners, and the global development community. The language of the communications products should also be an important consideration. Typically in USAID evaluation scopes of work, the evaluator is required to write a formal final report with an executive summary and present their findings internally to USAID. There were not many other communications products such as briefs, visualizations, videos, infographics, or global webinars to share findings with the broader de development community. Most respondents stated that they did not read the final reports, citing their academic language, which made the reports difficult to read and absorb. USAID staff are busy and overwhelmed, so they instead read the executive summary at most and rely on internal presentations to learn about the evaluation findings. Poor dissemination formats then have a negative impact on the capability to use evidence, as well as staff's motivation to use evidence. Next slide, please. Two systematic reviews have identified the timeliness of evidence production and how it overlays with the program cycle as an important aspect of evidence used by policymakers. At USAID, timing of evaluations and of dissemination of findings were frequently noted barriers to evaluation use. Staff felt that evaluation findings were often not shared in real time or were shared too late. For example, a midterm evaluation report is often not published until year four of a five-year activity, and administrative difficulties and status quo bias made it difficult for the existing activity to be changed or respond to the findings. The midterm evaluation was, however, generally used in the design of the follow-on activity. The final evaluation report was not published uh, until a year or so after the, the activity had concluded, 
at which point the follow on activity had already been designed and the implementing partner and country had already dispersed if it had not won the follow on. It was unclear how or if final evaluations affected decision making. Therefore, if midterm adaptation is the information need that USAID staff seek to fulfill, an evaluation may not be the correct tool to meet that information need. Next slide, please. The evidence shows that the lack of time to access and interpret evidence is a barrier to evidence-based decision-making. Information collection and use is often imperfect, impacting how an individual makes their decisions. Cognitive overload, that is when demands placed on people's mental effort are greater than their abilities to handle the work, often means that people do not take in all of the evidence or sources that could help them make an informed decision. Therefore, they revert to mental shortcuts, which can lead to mistakes. Similarly, USAID staff in general have very heavy workloads and demanding timelines, and a lot of unsynthesized data that is not stored in easily usable formats. Therefore, the time restraints to accessing evidence may result in deprioritizing or only a partial review of available evidence when making a decision. Next slide, please. USAID staff do not always consider evaluation evidence to be quality, credible, or relevant. One of the most commonly noted barriers was irrelevant evaluation findings. Some of the reasons for this are the tension between specific and more general evaluation findings, a lack of concrete recommendations, and the timing of the release of evidence and the evaluation questions selected in relation to key decision-making points. Since evaluators are external to USAID, their recommendations were sometimes not well informed by USAID's internal processes and priorities. Perceptions of poor quality or credibility of findings are in part linked to perceptions of evaluators, such as their subject matter expertise or their perceived neutrality, and in part to the methodology chosen. There were, for example, a preference for quantitative methods over qualitative methods. In particular, several staff felt that qualitative methods allowed for the inclusion of more bias from both the evaluator themselves as well as the key informants that they selected for their interviews. In addition, the dissemination format and its communication of the findings also impact on perceptions of quality of the evaluation itself. Next slide, please. USAID has a culture of evaluation use or evidence use. This seems to be an organizational norm and uh, that will support evaluation use. And there seems to be an expectation that staff use evidence to make their decisions. Interviewees cited ADS requirements for evidence use and mentioned that evaluations are used during portfolio reviews and that agency leadership regularly references learning and adaptation based on evidence. When someone cites evidence in their decision, their colleagues generally view that decision in a more positive light. This culture and evidence norm are also enforced in, in part by leadership. However, some respondents did feel that improvements could be made to USAID's organizational culture of evidence use. Next slide, please. Organizational leadership is an important contributor to evidence use. Leaders can show their support for evidence-based decision-making through the power of the purse or by demanding evidence be provided before a pro new program is funded. Other leaders do not have funding powers, but they still can ask their team for evidence when proposing a new action or conducting portfolio reviews. While there are many examples of such leaders, the processes and expectations for USAID leadership to promote evaluation use could benefit from expansion to ensure that evidence use is universally promoted and enforced. Individuals serving in a variety of roles can champion evidence use, such as USAID's MEL teams, agreement offers, officers representatives, or AORs, contracting officers representatives, or CORs, and the Delivery Improvement Division. Next slide, please. To ensure that USAID acts on evaluation findings and recommendations, some but not all evaluations 
are followed by the internal formulation of post-evaluation action plans. However, there is little accountability for ensuring that post-evaluation action plans are actually implemented. One promising way of combating some of these accountability challenges the interview suggested is for evaluators to facilitate a collaborative discussion of recommendations and specific actions that follow from the findings. For example, evaluators and their potential users, such as project staff, can spend time together to talk about and refine recommendations together and plot the way forward, agreeing on who will take forward each action. It is also not clear whose responsibility it is to promote findings use if it is not included in evaluators' contracts. Interviewees felt that for USAID to further promote evidence dissemination, it would need additional staff and financial resources and to form a broad community of practice. In addition, individual USAID staff are often constrained by security and procurement considerations from using their social media platforms to discuss USAID projects. This could be an important way for USAID to demonstrate to the broader public its support for evidence-based decision-making. Next slide, please. The most frequently mentioned enabler for increasing evidence use at USAID was ensuring user engagement throughout the evaluation process, from collaboratively forming uh, evaluation questions together to validating findings and creating action plans to then act on the evaluation recommendations. This could also help to build trust between evaluators and the uh, users and hopefully reduce defensiveness and allow for more constructive conversations. Engagement between evaluators and USAID staff also increased trust in evaluators themselves and improved perceptions of the relevance and credibility of findings. On the flip side, respondents often pointed to missed opportunities for interactions between evaluators and decision makers, which created disconnect between the parties. Next slide, please. So now I'll pass this over to my colleagues, Lucinda and Agata, who are going to talk about how these barriers and enablers led us to design some new behavioral strategies that could help increase evaluation use at USAID. Thank you very much, Cassandra. Indeed, we will discuss the strategies and these are behavioral strategies. So they, behave, they incorporate behavioral insights in their design. Over to you, Lucinda. Thanks, Agata. So the first strategy we're going to talk about, if we can go to the next slide. Um, yes, is the use of systematic reminders or prompts. Now, as Cassandra mentioned, people experience this cognitive overload of everything that's, that's being processed at one time. And simple and timely reminders have proven to be effective at sort of prompting people into prioritizing the desired behavior that you want to elicit, which of course in this case is evidence use. Now these reminders can be employed in three different ways. So first of all, automated reminders, which could come from something like an online evidence repository. And these would occur, these would be prompted out and sent to the relevant individuals when perhaps a new piece of evidence would be uploaded to the evidence repository. And again, this automated nudge at a key time just to nudge people towards new or in interesting information. A second approach could be autom um, non-automated and manual reminders, which are sent strategically during a project's life cycle or an individual's decision-making cycle. And therefore it's timed strategically to encourage people again, to prompt them towards new information, or just as a general reminder to make sure that their decisions are being you know, grounded in evidence. And finally, these prompts could be built into activity design guidelines or templates. So whatever kind of you know, documentation that people use and work through when they're creating um, new programs or designing something, these prompts can be inbuilt within to that and just again, nudge individuals to make sure they're prioritizing embedding evidence within their decision-making. Thanks, Cassandra. Um, thanks, Agata, over to you. Thank you, next slide, please. Right, so this strategy is really about using strategic communications, marketing, and behavioral techniques to more effectively disseminate findings. So the first way to do this is through audience segmentation and tailored communication products. This means identifying who are the audience groups for the findings, assessing what aspects of the findings would be most relevant and useful to them, and then creating tailored communication products. 
and you tailor the products um, by format. So for example, is it a policy brief that you're producing? Is it short video? Is it an email and so on? Tailor it by messages. So for example, you can pull out the most relevant findings for that audience and bring them to the top of the, the communication product for that audience. And you can tailor them in terms of language. So that includes uh, using more technical language in some products and you know, more colloquial language in other products. The other idea is to test messages that increase motivation to engage with the findings. So for example, by modifying just one aspect of an email communication, it's possible to check if a specific message is more effective than another in getting people to open that email, you know, to click on the link in that email. So as an example, you could uh, test a social norms based message, such as your colleagues have accessed this evaluation, have you? against a professional identity based message, such as as a USAT member, you use evidence to strengthen the impact of your work, click here for the latest findings. And finally, when you increase the motivation to use findings, you also want to make sure that you give people multiple ways to access the findings. So now I would say you would want to use at least three different channels uh, for communicating the findings. Uh, so, you know, you might use an email newsletter, you can do a webinar, you can have leaders announce uh, uh, the findings coming out. Uh, you could, you know, place the findings on online repository and send a, a reminder as well. Okay, next slide, please. So this strategy is around the development and improvement of user-friendly online evidence repositories. And this strategy was developed specifically with USAID's DEC or Development Experience Clearinghouse in mind, which is their current online evidence repository. And this really aims to both increase decision makers opportunity to actually access information and access evidence, but also by making them user-friendly and appealing, we're hoping to increase decision makers desire to seek out that evidence and then actually use it. And there are three sort of key components to these repositories. The first will be around the organization and presentation of evidence. So firstly, the synthesis of evidence, which is really important as make, to make things time efficient. So you're bringing in evidence from a variety of sources, different reports, different locations, and really synthesizing and pulling out the key insights into one location. And then the second is how this information is presented. So the evidence is quite clear that the use of things like infographics and simple graphs is a really good way of firstly improving how much people actually understand the information. But secondly, again, to communicate really complicated topics and also topics where there's a lot of uncertainty, perhaps where the results aren't completely clear cut. The second sort of component of these repositories would be around, again, this user experience piece. So by using human centered design, by placing the users of that information right at the center of how these repositories are designed, you're really helping to make sure people are able and want to use information. And for a repository, this is things like the use the different buttons that exist, the filters, the search terms. How can you really place the needs of the user right at the front of this design, as opposed to perhaps putting what you want to tell people or what's easier just to put in a repository? And finally, you can use nudges, so these behavioural pushes that direct people towards specific things. So this could be around um, social norms, as Agata mentioned. So can you make it clear that other people are using evidence, so perhaps you should too? And this could be things like um, how many times somebody's accessed a piece of information. So you're really establishing that e the, this evidence use is happening around you. And of course, again, as I mentioned before, these prompts, so you could inbuilt reminders into this repository, which is just nudging people to use the information. Next slide, please. So here we have an actual example of one of these, which I think is a really strong example from the Education Endowment um, Toolkit. And you can see here on the left there, this list of different types of uh, trainings. And on the right, they've evaluated them by different things like cost, by how strong the impact is, and by how long that impact might last. And at the top there, are these filters, so you can decide what range you're looking for. And hopefully, you know, just looking at this picture now, you can see that it's simple, it's clear, it's appealing, it's something that you can really tailor to your needs and therefore hopefully would be you know, easy to access and very motivational to actually use it. Next slide, please. 
Great, so this is about creating a community of designated evidence use champions and building a supportive organizational environment around them. Now this designation is really important because it helps build the champion's professional identity as evidence promoters, which then in turn should promote their behaviors in this role. So how do you build a community of evidence use champions? First, you'd want to offer champions some initial training. So that be in areas that would help them in this role. So things like advocacy, persuasion, for example. Um, and then you would want to offer continual networking and connect, connecting opportunities for the champions so they can learn from each other and get the extra social support from each other. It's also really important for champions to have a clear description of their role and have set goals. So they can set their goals with their line managers or you know, they could set their goals with the person leading on the evidence use champion project at the organization, for example. And that's important because goal setting is important for motivation. And they should also have clear responsibilities. So that obviously depends on the organization, but a couple of examples of you know, clear responsibilities would be uh, to uh, alert more senior staff at the organization when findings of relevance are available. So fi findings that are relevant to them are available. Um, another responsibility could be to follow up with individuals who are responsible for implementing recommendations from evaluations. And finally, it, you'd want to offer some kind of peer recognition to help incentivize champions work. So in this role, so for example, this can be a uh, kudos in a regular organizational communication or leaders could share messages on the role and the importance of the champions. Next slide, please. So this solution is around the training and then accreditation of the individuals who are, you know, disseminating the evidence and present and to make sure that they're really presenting their findings effectively and clearly in a way that people can understand. So the trainings could cover a variety of different things. Um, and we've just pulled out a couple here, which we think are quite key. So firstly, as Agat already mentioned, audience segmentation and tailored dissemination. So really thinking about the audience and really thinking how to tailor what you're creating to make sure that they're engaged and able to understand the information that you are presenting. The second is around using behavioral techniques really pulled in from behavioral science to frame and present information. And the framing effect is a cognitive bias that basically when people decide on an option based on actually how the option is presented as opposed to necessarily what is contained within those options. So for example, there's a bias which we experience, which is called loss aversion. And this is a fear that humans have, that we fear the loss of something which is greater than the happiness of gaining that same quantity. So, for example, if you said the medicine did not work 40% of the time versus the medicine worked 60% of the time. Now, this communicates the same actual information but it's just framed differently. So in this example, people would respond more strongly to hearing that the medicine did not work 40% of the time. So the training would work to present sort of examples like this and to really encourage people to think about how they can frame evidence to elicit that response of using the evidence. And then the third training topic could be around data visualization. So this is not behavioral, you know, this is not complex of computer science per se, but just very simple techniques about how to use visual to communicate evidence as opposed to relying solely on words. And this accreditation would work in two ways. So firstly, it's an incentive. People would want to seek this accreditation out. They would want to have that sort of stamp of approval that this is something that qualifies them. And secondly, it provides whoever's looking at the information, so the decision maker, with confidence that the individuals are accredited, that they're trained, and therefore they're much more likely to feel that the evidence is reliable and high quality. And this training and accreditation would be accompanied by a communications campaign, which promotes that accreditation, making it widely known and therefore much more likely again to be seen as quality and credible. 
And finally, it would need to have supporting materials. So documents and guidance that would accompany this training to support the individuals creating evidence, you know, to read through it, to have clear guidelines, to have clear to approaches and techniques that are written down on paper to accompany their training. Over to you, Agata, for the next slide. Okay. So this is around social incentive. So social incentives really refers to making the use of the influence of people around us, and especially people who are important to us for a particular behavior. So, you know, in the, this context around evaluation use, that's likely to be direct line managers, you know, senior leaders, but that can also be influential peers. And this is important because social influence has proven effective for behavior change in you know, many different contexts, many different domains. So an organization could set up structures for peer praise and recognition for the use of evaluation findings. Now these could be standalone structures or standalone interventions, or this could be built into you know, existing um, structures. And we again here have just three examples of how this could be done. The first example is having an employee of the month or quarter. This is where you know, one person or one team would be profiled with an example of how they use evaluation findings over that period. Another example is to draw evaluation evidence used as a theme from competitions. So an example of this at USAID is the collaborating, learning and adapting case competition. So here you could explicitly draw out evidence used as a theme from a competition. Uh, and then what you wanna do is you really wanna communicate broadly about the winners around that theme. And if you wanted to, you could even you know, give the theme kind of a catchy title to really make it stand out. Finally, you could also build recognition into managers performance review processes around uh, evidence use or evaluation evidence use. So, you know, this can be a standard key performance indicator or KPI, but it could also be something additional, like an additional indicator with its own separate reward, you know, and that reward maybe could be a shout out by leaders in the course of a annual event, a major event at the organization. Next slide, please. So it's often very natural when evidence is created to bring decision makers and the evidence generators into one room and it feels very natural to have one, an interaction between the two. However, the evidence suggests that often these interactions aren't actually effective at increasing evidence use of the decision makers. However, if these are structured thoroughly with um, very well designed theories of changes and are inbuilt within to the interaction, these have been shown to be effective. So they work in a variety of ways, primarily to build trust and to ensure that the findings are actually useful and relevant for future decisions. And this can be done through a variety of different ways to make sure that these structured interactions are effective. Firstly, to have clear processes which ensure transparency and evaluator independence. And this can be done by things like code of conduct or sort of standard operating procedures. And they work in multiple different ways. But firstly, this clear process that's outlined establishes trust between the two parties. It clearly shows that, uh, that to the uh, decision makers that the evaluators are competent, that they have a clear process and that they've really thought through what they're doing. And then, of course, that second piece, that you know, evaluator independence, really important to make sure that the parties understand how they're going to work to ensure independence is still occurring. The second piece is around setting up right from the kickoff meetings of these interactions, both professional and group identities. And the professional identity piece is around really making sure that the individuals involved identify first and foremost as evidence users and not perhaps as, say, a defender of a programme, which perhaps sometimes we're all inclined to do when we're sort of defending a programme we've been heavily involved in. Now, to set up these professional identities, this can be done in simple ways, such as goal setting. So can you encourage everyone involved in the evaluation, for example, to really set up a goal for that evaluation for themselves, which is around using evidence to, say, reduce maternal and child deaths, as opposed to perhaps to defend their programme or their programme outputs? 
And then the second part of the identity is around the group identity. So evidence shows that two, the two different parties, people are more defensive when criticism or, or sort of comments are coming from an external party. And what this, this piece really aims to do is to establish a single unified group identity between the evidence user and the evidence generator. And again, this could be done by a goal. So you could set a goal for the whole group to you know, better understand a program, to use the evidence well, as opposed to, again, this defending of a program, really about the evidence use as a goal. And another piece could be around labeling. So could you come up with a group identity, a label, which identifies you as a whole group, as opposed to these two separate uni un unity groups? And this really, again, works to increase trust between the parties and to de decrease defensiveness, making it more likely that people actually use and read the evidence. And then the final section to this interaction will be around the co-development of both the evaluation questions and the recommendations. And this really looks to answer that piece that Cassandra talked about at the beginning around things not feeling um, relevant. And so by developing questions and recommendations together, this is ensuring that the information is seen to be relevant, it's high quality, and that both parties are fed in, therefore they feel more invested and more trusting in whatever evidence use and comments on the evaluation are outputted. Over to you, Agata, next slide. Thank you. And last but not least, this strategy, strategy is really focused on individuals who commission an evaluation. So it's about creating a decision-making tool for selecting the right learning activity or evidence generating method. So an evaluation may or may not be the best activity to address specific information needs and to do so in a timely manner. So this tool would help guide thinking around you know, the research questions, the intended user groups, and also the key decision-making points when that evidence, when that learning would be used or needs to be used. And this tool would incorporate you know, one or more strategies for improving decision by reducing bias. So, um, you know, for example, uh, one way to help reduce bias is to encourage people to consider the opposite of whatever decision they are about to make. Right, so next slide, please. And that's it. We have covered all the ground we wanted to cover. So we will um, move on to the Q&A now. Um, and I will open the Q&A. Please remember that if you have a question, we'll put it in the Q&A and not into the chat box. All right, so going from uh, the beginning, um, the first question is, if USAID does not read the reports, what is the val value of funding and conducting the evaluations? To what extent are learning questions developed that guide evaluation purpose, aims, goals, methods, et cetera? So, um, sorry, we didn't mean to suggest that, you know, USAID does not read the reports. Of course, the individuals who commission the reports will read them. And the point is that, um, you know, there's a lot of additional individuals who may not have commissioned an evaluation who might find the findings useful or, you know, the findings would be relevant to them, to the decisions they're making. And these individuals are unlikely to read, you know, a really long report. You know how it is, we're all busy. Um, it's it's hard to get through even our short list, sort of short reading list some days. So the point here is that, you know, people are overloaded with information and also that um, oftentimes the, you um, uh, there is no additional step after the report. The report is important, but what we need to do is, you know, try to um, then create products that pull out relevant information for individuals for different groups, um, you know, that pre present the relevant information in more concise formats so that individuals who are, you know, really time constrained, um, you know, quite overwhelmed, have heavy workloads, do look at these findings and, you know, see what is most relevant and important to them. Um, the second question is, um, how did you define evidence? Did you include use of performance as well as impact evaluations? So for this study, we are really looking at evaluation findings only, so of course in global health programs, and we were looking at, um, we only looked at performance evaluations in this case. 
then we have, did you have any additional thoughts on effectively, ooh, sorry, things are moving around a little bit. And Cassandra and Lucinda, please jump in at any point. Uh, next question is, do you have any additional thoughts on effectively engaging research users throughout the evaluation process while ensuring evaluation independence? Lucinda, did you want to speak at all about that? That's a really good question. I think it's something we wrestled with quite a lot as we were sort of thinking it through. Um, I'm not sure I honestly have anything very concrete to add to that, I'm afraid. I think it really depends on the evaluation context. Um, and I think, so I, I'd be hesitant to suggest anything specific, but I think it, it is really about that sort of code of conduct piece. So making sure that things are written down very, very clearly from the start and the sort of where the boundaries are are clearly established. And I think that everything's recorded as well to make sure that there's sort of accountability. If there is any questioning on that, on that sort of independence piece, that you can refer very clearly to where things have already been re recorded. But really happy to think that through with you more offline or whatever's appropriate, because it's a great question. I think that independence piece is really important. Hmm. Yeah, the one more thing I guess I'd add is we talked about, we thought through a bit about how the actual interactions are facilitated. So what's the role of the facilitator in the room, uh, whether it's, you know, a live or, or a virtual meeting that is being held? And how can the facilitator ensure that uh, the power dynamics uh, in the room don't make it so that uh, when, we're, when questions such as the methodology um, are discussed. So that doesn't appear as, you know, the, the funders have much more um, of a say and are, you know, pushing the evaluator to make any compromises on a methodology, for example. Um, so, you know, a facilitator can be really important in those types of interactions, making sure, you know, that everybody has a say, that there's different ways for individuals in the meeting to contribute based on their different roles, you know, their different styles of communication and so on. Okay, so next question. Oh, Let's see, sorry, things are keep moving. <laughs> um, ah, yes. Okay, thank you for a great presentation. Thank you. Uh, could you please elaborate on pre testing? Do we test the ability to motivate or the ability to persuade and act? Okay, so I think in this case, you're probably. Um, referring to the testing of messages that I mentioned, um, I'm guessing, um, because I don't think we spoke about other types of test testing, Cassandra, just going to correct me if I'm wrong. But um, yeah, so if we're talking about that kind of testing, we are um, doing, in this case, some basic testing uh, regarding behavior, but it's, you know, the behavior, it would be whether the individual opens an email, whether they click on a link. Of course, this doesn't have to be, the testing doesn't have to be just done via email. You could test different messages online, for example. You could, you know, uh, for example, if we have an online repository of evidence, you could check if, you know, you could test um, one week, use one kind of message, for example, and then another week, another, and there's other ways, obviously, to do testing online. Um, you could, you know, split by different groups and so on. But, um, Point is, uh, we would check, you know, if people engage with the findings of the actual materials, the products that are produced um, in that type of testing. So, you know, we're not, unfortunately, through that type of testing, we're not, you know, actually testing whether that leads to the use of evidence. We're just testing engagement with the findings. Next one is, these are great questions, by the way. Thank you. Um, how can evidence use champions be cultivated among local stakeholders? Yeah, that's a, that's a nice question. Um, so, you know, when we were thinking about evidence use champion, because of the context of the study, we were, you know, definitely, you know, initially thinking of the USAID context. So USAID missions, USAID headquarters. Um, but, uh, you know, I think, uh, similar, um, you know, approaches could be used, of course, right? I think, you know, again, um, the certain similar types of trainings on, you know, to give people the skills to promote evidence use could be used. Um, and, you know, to that end, similar types of approaches to the training could be used. Um, we didn't really discuss this much in this presentation, but, you know, um, 
using really effective proven adult learning techniques for those trainings um, is important as well, but also, you know, kind of building in um, support. So um, that support is really important. So we wouldn't want to just work with the individuals who are the champions, but you also want to, you know, see how you can involve the leaders of the um, organizations where these champions sit, you know, whatever, wherever they may be sitting um, and, and to make sure that, you know, there's also this kind of supportive leadership environment for the champions. I don't know if Lucinda or Cassandra, you want to add to that one? It's a great question. It's something I think we want to think through a bit more, quite frankly. I think I got you onto that very, very well. But um, I, guess, I guess the only other thing to add is that um, it, it has been done. Like there are examples, there are studies out there where evidence use of champions have been sort of, you know, developed and, and trained in, in local context and they've been really effective. And I think perhaps the other pieces around the clear sort of scope of work and the clear labeling of being an evidence use champion, which I think Agata mentioned, but I think when you're giving somebody the authority to be that champion, it's a really important piece, like whatever the context, to make sure that they, they're clear that they have that authority to, you know, to really push for the use of evidence and really talk and engage with leaders um, to, yeah, to do so. Yeah, thank you. The next one is more of a comment. In my experience, having worked on several USAID evaluations, the contract for USAID evaluations end with a report. There is no dissemination planning or steps for evidence to action. Your uh, your presentation confirmed much of my experience. Um, yeah. <laughs> um, okay, next one. Um, okay. Next one is, did you feel like you were able to reach saturation with the data from these four evaluations or that more research is really needed to identify strategies that could support evaluation at USAID broadly? Yeah, good question, Tori. Uh, of course, uh, of course, four evaluations is only four evaluations. So that is a limitation, unfortunately. Uh, we do feel like, you know, we got sufficient content definitely to, you know, to be able to share the strategies that, you know, we have, um, but uh, more research is always needed. And, you know, if, uh, you know, my advice is always, if you're going to implement a behavioral intervention of any sort, the context is always different and the context will always impact on behavior and how an intervention works. So you always want to test an intervention in a new context. So, you know, whether it's about doing more research or is it about, uh, identifying a place, you know, where you, a location or, you know, um, a situation where you want to test a strategy and then doing perhaps a rapid kind of assessment, um, you know, it doesn't have to be a full on study like we did here, maybe doing a rapid assessment of the barriers and enablers um, and then testing an, um, an approach and seeing if it works in that context or not. I'm just going to pause after every time I answer just to check with Cassandra Lucinda. Okay, the next one is please comment on whether the study looked at the extent USAID coordinates evaluations, publishing or, re publishing or review studies conducted and are funded by other national development institutions such as DFID, BMZ, etc. For example, should if should if so, how could USAID be informed by sim, uh, by similar BMZ evaluation on the same thing? And if so, how beyond ad hoc does USAID publicize evaluation efforts or look to collaborate? Oh, good question. And uh, this isn't something we specifically looked at. And I do not recall myself seeing any discussion on this. But uh, perhaps Cassandra has. No, you're shaking your head. No. I mean, yeah, the particular ones that we looked into didn't reference that. Um, and, and, and talking about how to publicize to other donors, but um, it is possible there are other evaluations that do that were not included in our study. Mm -hmm. And I think quickly, oh, yeah, just, I mean, obviously the, yeah, so the development experience clearinghouse I talked about is USAID's online repository, and that is free to access for anyone. So 
it's good that there's a stage one that, you know, USAID are publishing. Mo I think most, I can't comment on all, but, you know, the majority of their ev evaluation findings publicly. But I guess the next stage is then, as, as you mentioned, is really linking that up to really make sure that the donors are speaking to each other. And yeah, as Augusta mentioned, that's sort of a stage beyond what we looked at, um, but really, really interesting and so, so important. Hmm. Okay, great. Next was, how can we ensure evaluation use across the sectors nationwide? Oh, yeah, <laughs> it's a great question. That is, a, that is the big question. I mean, you know, maybe I, I might give a little bit of an unsatisfactory answer, but I guess the first step is to actually have a strategy for doing that and, uh, you know, to um, understand who is it that you want to use the findings, uh, who are your audiences, you know, it's, I mean, we're kind of repeating that a lot, but um, it's the first step, understanding who are those audiences and what, you know, what are their information needs, um, what will be of most relevance, relevant to them. Um, I think the other thing is, you know, engaging um, intended users of any evidence um, early, as early as possible, um, so that they get, you know, not waiting till it's time to disseminate the findings to engage the users, if possible, of course, it depends uh, who those audiences are, but if possible, you know, if you, you know exactly that there are, you know, key departments in certain ministries, for example, um, that you'd want to be, um, uh, looking at that evidence once it's produced, then, you know, in some way engaging them early on in the process um, so that they, you know, feel like they have a sense of ownership that they, you know, even if it's, uh, it's not necessarily about, you know, getting them to um, uh, contribute what they would want to see in terms of the, you know, exact evaluation questions, right? I mean, that's impossible. You can't get everybody's input on research questions, but some kind of early engagement, it can help to kind of drive that sense of ownership and, and interest. Um, okay, uh, next one is, did your findings reveal any insights into the types of form or formats of evidence products that target audience users preferred? Could use of evidence differ based on the evidence is packaged beyond tailoring content to different audience segments? So yes, I mean, I think it definitely would, uh, the use would definitely differ on um, how evidence is packaged be beyond tailor tailoring. So I think, you know, formats definitely matter. Um, interesting enough, I, you know, I don't know if we can come to any conclusions as to which formats work better, other than, of course, again, seeing that kind of shorter formats, um, anything that uses, you know, kind of plain language, you know, less academic language seems to be, um, you know, viewed more favorably. Um, I don't know if Cassandra, if you have any views on that one or No, and I think that could be you know, uh, where some of that testing that Agata uh, spoke about could come into play. Um, you know, for our particular uh, about, uh, report ourselves, we've put together, you know, this webinar, the the final report, a, a briefing, a briefer, and uh, an infographic. So it would be interesting to see kind of by number of clicks and where they come from you think um who's accessing those um but uh we didn't dig into exactly which are used by different audiences mm, yeah yeah it's a good point cassandra right we should we should do a test on our own <laughs> on our own dissemination yeah <laughs> right next one is how best can one deal with lack of trust in evaluation results by stakeholder decision makers, especially when they have predetermined thoughts? Yeah, that is a very, yeah. very good and a very important question. I see you nodding your head, Lucinda. Did you want to? <laughs> yeah, I mean, again, a question that's completely spot on. I think it's quite clear that trust is one of those really fundamental pieces when we're talking about any form of knowledge exchange. And I think. I think so some of the pieces I mentioned about these structured interactions actually were specifically regarding trust. So 
Firstly, about transparency. Again, it's really, really important that there's clarity about what's happening and, and why. I think the why piece, often people don't trust someone's capability because they're not seeing behind the scenes. So by being really clear and transparent upfront, you're showing your working, you're showing your thinking, you're showing the organisation or the individual's capabilities. Um, and I think um, not advocating very clearly for, for a specific thing can be quite important. So trying to come in very neutrally, making sure that, you know, you don't trying not to lay out perhaps your vested interest, but making it um, more, yeah, more clear that you're, you're, you're neutral. You're not specifically advocating for one outcome, one result, one, you know, they're not, you're not predetermined yourself perhaps. Um, the other thing is about regular contact and preferably face to face, which is all, of course so hard when we work in an international setting, but um, regular contacts being shown to be quite important with regards to building trust, which perhaps isn't surprising, but is, is difficult. Um, so if possible, at least some face to face interactions, but if not failing that regular online interactions. Um, and then finally, also, again, as I mentioned, being able to demonstrate independence so being able to make it clear where your boundaries are and how you're operating it linked again to that transparency piece. But being able to establish your independence, I think, is also um, really important. But that's I know that's not very satisfactory. Again, like trust is such a, a complicated topic to talk about. But those are just some key kind of things to be thinking about um, as a starting point. Anyway, I hope that's helpful. Yeah, great. Thanks. And the last question I see here, is it necessary to conduct baseline and line studies in order to effectively define evidence? So I'm not sure if I 100% understand the question. Do you mean, um, is, it is it that we won't call it, we shouldn't call it evidence unless we have a baseline and end line? You know, maybe Anthony, you could elaborate a little bit on that. Um, I mean, I wouldn't, I mean, you know, if, if that's the question, I would say no, evidence comes in all different forms. Um, and it's, you know, you don't necessarily need a baseline and end line. There's many different ways to gather evidence. And um, there are, you know, uh, definitely pros and cons to the different methodologies. Um, but maybe you can elaborate on that, Anthony, if I didn't understand that correctly. And from, and here we go, maybe the last question. Building on the trust question, did you get any sense of what might help to improve trust in qualitative methods? Ah, uh, yeah, Jessica, that's a great question. <laughs> um, I don't think we did, but Sandra, listen, that you can correct me if I'm wrong. I don't know if we actually dug deep into that, even though, of course, this is something that came up a few times um, as an issue, but I don't think we have anything conclusive to say about that. Um, I don't think we necessarily do, but I think a lot of the concerns was about bias and about evaluators perhaps um, selecting the answers that they preferred or that they felt or that they didn't interview enough people and so those answers were biased and I so I think being clear about the rigor of the methods how many people we are actually uh speaking to and to what extent uh these opinions are being repeated by a number of people and then just being very transparent about the evidence that we've collected you know even if you know, it's not necessarily all included in the final report, maybe having some way to show that evidence in a, in a de-identified way so that people can look through and see that, you know, we're not necessarily trying to pre-screen anything um, and show. And also I think there's a, there's a tension between um, the, of, uh, the, the selection of sites uh, between either the, the donor and then the evaluators themselves. So just being very clear, I think, about um, why you selected those sites um, and on what basis you made those and, and having a design report ahead of time that puts forward those, those criteria uh, instead of kind of, you know, explaining it on the back end, I suppose. <laughs> hmm. Yeah. 
Thank you, Cassandra. And our last question said is thanks, Lucinda. So I think we will end there because we're at the top of the hour. Thank you so much, everyone. Thank you for joining. Thank you for the great questions. Um, and we will be disseminating more widely on what we learned. Uh, so look out for you know our report and our brief and infographic being published in, in due course. Thanks, everyone. Have a great day.